Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. If you don't know, I'm Matthew Greco, the PSS uh, Events Life View Manager. And today we're very lucky to have David Kuttner back and Cindy Custer from the firm of Lampson and Kuttner. And today, David is going to be talking about the intricacies of Medicaid, community Medicaid versus nursing home Medicaid. If you have questions, please put them into the chat and uh, David and Cindy will attempt to answer them as we go along. Uh, and with that, I'm just going to hand it right over to David. Thank you, Matt. And uh, great to be here again with PSS. And I hope everyone can see my screen okay. Uh, as you can see, as Matt said, we're going to talk about Medicaid, uh, community Medicaid, and nursing home Medicaid. <clears throat> That's our law firm, offices in New York City and in Westchester. So, uh, first of all, thank you to PSS again for hosting us uh, with this presentation. So, let's jump into it. Um, I think this is a good place to start. Uh, and I have to say, when I saw this statistic for the first time, it shocked me. Uh, it comes from the U.S. Department of Health. Uh, their statistics show that seven out of 10 people over the age of 65 will need some kind of long-term care of some kind at some point. And four out of 10 will need nursing home care. And needless to say, long-term care is just so expensive, crushingly expensive, or as our Court of Appeals said, ruinously expensive. Um, we see clients all the time who are spending five, 10, 15, even $20,000 a month on their long-term care. You really need to have a plan uh, to deal with this. Uh, for most people, it's devastating financial. So <clears throat> a lot of people think, and I know this because clients tell me all the time, uh, not to worry, I have Medicare. Well, guess what? Medicare does not cover long-term care. It is excellent medical insurance. Uh, doctors, hospitals, uh, PT, OT, uh, everything medical uh, it covers and uh, it covers rehabilitation. So if you're hospitalized and uh, sent to a rehab center for uh, rehabilitation, uh, which often is in a nursing home, uh, Medicare will cover the rehabilitation for up to 100 days. And a lot of people tend to forget about the up to part of this, uh, you don't have a right to 100 days. You have a right to up to 100 days. And very often the rehabilitation is much shorter than 100 days. Uh, so <clears throat> that can be a real critical point. You know, you're in the hospital, you're discharged to rehabilitation. And two weeks later, uh, rehab is over. And now, uh, you're not able to resume life as before, you need help, you need care, uh, that's when you're going to start spending money if you don't have a plan. Um, as you can see on this uh, particular slide, uh, if you have uh, traditional Medicare, which would be uh, Part B, uh, you may want to have and probably will want to have uh, a supplement plan or so-called Medigap plan, a plan that would cover your uh, co-pays and, uh, and at least part of your prescription drugs. So we need to ask this question, who pays for long-term care? Uh, obviously, private pay, you can pay for it yourself. Uh, you don't want to, and for most people, you can't really afford to, uh, and you don't want to impose that burden on your children, although very often uh, children and other members of the family are trying to pick up the slack there and 
and help to pay for it. Uh, there is long-term care insurance. Uh, most people don't have it. Uh, I think I saw a statistic that for those over 65, less than 3%, <clears throat> less than 3% of the population uh, has long-term care insurance. Um, if you are thinking about long-term care insurance or if you already have it, uh, you do want to pay attention, close attention to the terms of the policy. Uh, usually you have an initial exclusion period. So the first 90 days or the first 120 days uh, after you file a claim, uh, that's private pay. The insurance company isn't going to cover it if you have a 90-day exclusion or some other exclusion period. And then the daily benefit is really critical. Uh, I see all too often people who have a long-term care insurance policy and they think they're covered and everything's fine, but the daily benefit is only $100 or $150. Well, that's okay, I guess, if all you ever need is three or four hours of home care. But what if you need eight or 10 or 12 hours or 24 hours of home care? What if you need assisted living care? Or what if you need nursing home care? Uh, because we could be talking about a daily expense of $500, for example. So what do you do if you have $100 or $150 of insurance and a $500 actual cost? Where is the rest of the money coming from? If the answer is, all too often, oh gosh, I guess I'll have to take some money out of savings. You know, that's not a good answer. The insurance is really not serving the function that it's supposed to and that you hoped it would, which is to protect your savings and your assets. So uh, again, want to be careful. It's not to say it's not a good product if you can afford it and if you can get it, uh, but we really need to pay attention to the terms of the policy. There's also a, typically a lifetime maximum. Uh, we want to make sure that's not too small uh, because, again, it's uh, this type of care is expensive and we can reach that maximum maybe all too quickly and then there's no more insurance. So the big player here is Medicaid. Uh, that's what we're gonna spend most of our time on today. Uh, so let me move ahead here. Uh, and you know, before I get into this particular slide about what community Medicaid covers, I just think it's worth noting a couple of things about Medicaid. Uh, first of all, unlike Medicare, which is a federal program, federal medical insurance. Uh, Medicaid is a partnership program between the federal government and each of the states. And every state has different laws and every state uh, has different budgets. So what we see as we look around the country, uh, the Medicaid program in other states uh, differs from ours in New York. Uh, so it's nice to know that we have the very best Medicaid program. Uh, and I have no doubt about that. We spend more money in absolute dollars. We spend more money in uh, per person dollars. Uh, we have friendlier laws, if I could put it that way. Uh, that you will find in every other state. And I think uh, another point that's worth making is that uh, providers of services, whether it's home care, adult day care, assisted living care, uh, nursing home care, um, these are all private businesses. Um, the government is not in the business of offering uh, or running 
operating these facilities. They don't own them, they don't operate them, uh, maybe except apart from the Veterans Administration. But your home care agency, your nursing home, these are private businesses. Um, they have a choice whether they want to accept payment from Medicaid or not. So if you have any complaint about the service or what you're getting, uh, it really isn't because it's second class, uh, because it's Medicaid. You know, if you don't like the aid, it's because of the aid. It's not because the aid <clears throat> uh, was covered under the Medicaid program. I think that's important fact to you. You know, you're really not getting uh, second class type of uh, care or protection under the Medicaid program. So let's see what we have here. Community Medicaid, uh, the big one here is home care. Um, the reference to CDPAP, uh, that means uh, the Consumer Directed Personal Assistance Program, uh, which is a program where you can select your own home aid rather than working with a home care agency. Uh, you have even the ability of a family member to be uh, your aid and be paid by Medicaid. Uh, and that would come under this uh, CDPAP uh, program, or you can work with the home care agency. Um, in New York, we have adult daycare. Uh, we have assisted living covered under our community Medicaid program. Uh, we have a number of programs for special needs, uh, such as traumatic brain injury or kidney disease or Gehrig's disease, other things that uh, where we have a special program. Uh, and then, of course, hospital and medical care and therapies and, and drugs all covered under the Medicaid program. Very big program in New York. Uh, in a lot of states, the community program is not anything approaching what we have in New York. Um, institutional Medicaid or nursing home Medicaid covers your care in the nursing home. And good to know because care in a nursing home is typically uh, in the New York metropolitan area is probably averaging around 15000 a month. Very expensive. So how do we get Medicaid, how do we qualify? So you can see on this slide that Medicaid eligibility is based on what Medicaid calls resources. And your monthly income is not a determinant of your Medicaid eligibility. This is important. I hear all the time people say, oh, uh, I'm not going to be able to get Medicaid, I have too much income. No, that's not correct. Your income is not going to determine whether you are eligible or not. It's your resources. So resources are assets, uh, not every asset. Medicaid's not interested in what's in your jewelry box or your stamp collection or what's parked in your garage. Uh, so let's put all of the tangible personal property aside. Uh, Medicaid is interested in knowing your, essentially your financial resources, your checking, your savings, your investments and mutual funds, stocks, bonds, et cetera, cash value of insurance. Uh, they'll look at real estate, co-ops, um, all of that we're going to take into account in determining whether you're eligible. And as you can see, the number is a low one, uh, $31,175 uh, currently in 2024. Uh, that number usually changes a little bit every year. Um, it'll probably go up a little bit in 2025, but not by much, I wouldn't think. Uh, so it's a low number, uh, and we're going to talk about um, how to become eligible for Medicaid. Uh, 
Uh, so please don't be discouraged here. Uh, there are uh, perfectly proper legal strategies that you can employ to become Medicaid eligible. Uh, so just a couple of words about the income. As I said, it's not going to determine eligibility. Uh, however, there is an income limit. Uh, currently $1,732 a month. So when you file your application, you must disclose your monthly income. And that includes your Social Security, your pension, your distributions from your IRA, uh, rents, royalties, whatever you would put on your tax return as ordinary income, Medicaid's going to count. So the good news here is you can protect your monthly income. I mean, you can contribute it to the cost of your care. That's one of your options. I think most people don't want to do that. They need their monthly income to pay their rent or their mortgage or their co-op maintenance. Um, so we can take advantage of something called a pooled income trust, uh, which functions like another bank account and uh, protect our monthly income. And I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later on this afternoon. <clears throat> so uh, first, let's take a look at nursing home eligibility because we're comparing the, looking at the differences rather. So eligibility test is uh, the same number. Uh, resources not to exceed $31,175. However, uh, for nursing home, we have something called the five-year look back. And I know uh, some of you, I'm sure, have heard that term before. Uh, what it means is when you file an application uh, to have Medicaid pay your nursing home bill, uh, you must have resources of no more than 31175 And you must also disclose all of your financial transactions going back five years. And the reason why Medicaid is asking for that is they want to know whether you transferred ownership of money or property uh, that resulted in your getting your uh, resource level down to that $31,000. And if you have made gifts or transfers, uh, maybe to children, maybe to uh, transfer to a trust, uh, maybe a transfer to a close friend, um, you will be penalized for having done that, uh, the penalty being a period of time that you are not eligible to have Medicaid pay the nursing home bill. So <clears throat> when we're thinking about Medicaid, we always have to bear in mind, uh, if not top of mind, at least back of mind, that if we need nursing home care, we are going to be confronted with the five-year look back. So on the income side, again, uh, income is not a factor of el eligibility. Um, however, you're going to have to give up all your income one way or the other. Uh, you can only keep $50 a month. Uh, if you have a spouse who is still in the community, uh, he or she is entitled to a monthly income uh, of $3,853.50. Uh, so if your spouse uh, doesn't have much in the way of income, uh, you're the one in the nursing home and you have, you've been the big earner and you have more income, uh, 
your income would first be applied to uh, provide for the community spouse. Then if there's anything left, after he or she gets up to that $3,800 a month number, it would go to the nursing home. A question, Cindy? You're yes, I have a question. So uh, I actually have two questions, two good questions. Uh, oh, actually, let's see. Oh, now the second question will be for later. The first question is, um, uh, does spousal impoverishment does spousal impoverishment apply to community-based Medicaid? Uh, no, we're really not worried about this in community Medicaid. Uh, uh, you can transfer money to a spouse. You can put money in a trust. You can transfer money to children. Uh, the question on the application is, what do you have in the way of resources? Uh, so your spouse does not need to be impoverished in order for you to get Medicaid, quite the opposite. In, in the community, in community Medicaid. Right. Okay. Uh, and the other, the next question is uh, about the costs of a pooled trust, but uh, um, you haven't gotten to the pooled trust yet. So I'll, I'll let you, uh, so, so the cost of the pooled trust is the initiation fee versus monthly or yearly, but I, I know you're going to talk about that. So I'll just remember uh, the person who asked that question uh, that it'll be coming up. <clears throat> okay. Uh, you know, just a, another quick word about the uh, community spouses. Um, you know, as a spouse, um, all of us have a legal obligation of support for our spouse. Uh, so because of that, Medicaid does have an opportunity to ask spouses, uh, why aren't you taking care of your husband or your wife, as the case may be? Uh, <clears throat> and if Medicaid is paying for them, uh, Medicaid does have a right to come back uh, to the well spouse and ask for reimbursement of Medicaid's expenses. Um, you know, this is really a, an issue that we see in the nursing home context and really not so much in the community side. Just wanted to put that out there. All right. <clears throat> and so I'd already mentioned the look back. Um, again, as we see at the top there, um, uh, nothing wrong with transferring money or property. It's not illegal, it's not improper, it's not unethical. Uh, Medicaid has never made such a claim. Um, it's New York law. New York law has been this way for decades. All right. On the community side, uh, we have never had a look back. Uh, <clears throat> the question has always been, what are your assets, your resources at the time you're filing the application? There's no inquiry uh, into what you may have done a month or two or a year or however long prior to your application. Uh, there's no penalty, there's no consequence to you or to anyone uh, if you have transferred assets uh, prior to the time you filed your community Medicaid application. <clears throat> so will we ever have a look back for community Medicaid, uh, we don't know. Uh, there was a 30 month look back that was enacted by our legislature back in the year 2000. Uh, it's never been implemented. Uh, it's been delayed several times. Uh, the last delay took us into 2025. Uh, I think it's anybody's guess uh, whether it will be implemented in 2025. Uh, my own personal guess is that it will not be implemented, but I don't 
don't know. I guess I could be wrong. Uh, it just doesn't seem very likely to me. We've never had one before. It would be uh, a tremendous uh, amount of work for Medicaid to be able to do it, just in terms of staffing and training and so on. It just doesn't look very likely to me, but we'll see. Um, on the nursing home side, though, we do have this five-year look back that I've already uh, explained. <clears throat> if uh, we make transfers of money and property, uh, we may be subject to a period of ineligibility. Um, and one other uh, part of the Medicaid program I wanted to mention here is the so-called NHTD program, which stands for Nursing Home Transition Diversion. And the idea of this program is to try to help people stay home who want to stay home, uh, even if they qualify and maybe should be in a nursing home. Uh, <clears throat> so that's why it's a diversion program. We're keeping people at home and we're providing um, essentially a nursing home level of care at home. And it's automatically 24-7 care in your home. Uh, so interesting program uh, for people who need uh, a level of care that corresponds to nursing home, but they would rather stay home. Uh, this may be a possibility for you, the NHTD program. <clears throat> so uh, here's a question, an important one that I hear all the time. Uh, is my home exempt? But before I get to that, go ahead, Cindy. Sorry, yes, yeah, some, somebody um, uh, <clears throat> asked, said, uh, one, one of the uh, attendees said, I have referred many clients to NHTD and they have not been able to reach the Westchester Independent Living Center or ESSA. Uh, any tips? Have we had any success with the NHTD? I know that they are, uh, it's very, it's a, there aren't a lot, uh, there's some issues sometimes. Um. I guess I would say in our law firm, uh, we've had a number of clients in the NHDD program. I think we have been successful getting people into the program. Um, not easy to do. You do have to first qualify uh, for home care and uh, be receiving home care through an MLTC. Um, it does help in applying for the NHTD program uh, to um, have uh, or be suffering from some dementia. Uh, that is something they look at, I guess, in a positive way, if you will, for at least for the program purposes. Um, but, you know, admittedly, it's not uh, easy to get into this program. Uh, in our law firm, we have a dedicated staff member who uh, who works on, on this uh, particular program and helps our clients uh, who qualify uh, get into it. I think that's really all I could say about it, uh, at, you know, at this point. Um, it's, I think a lot of people don't even know about it. Um, it. It is, I think, a very good program for those who qualify and who want to stay home. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, so, the, uh, sorry, then two follow on questions. Uh, who pays for NHTD and does the NHTD help with costs of housing? Those are the two questions. Well, NHTD is a Medicaid program. Medicaid pays for the care, mm -hmm. right? Um, Medicaid, I don't think any of the Medicaid programs pay for housing. Uh, other than if you're in a nursing home or in an assisted living that's covered by Medicaid. Mm -hmm. uh, but otherwise, you know, living at home, your living expenses are your responsibility. Yep. 
And uh, and who pays for NHTD? Is this a, it's a Medicaid program? Yes, this is a Medicaid program. So okay. Medicaid Medicaid pays for the care. It's automatically twenty four seven uh, care in the home with uh, typically uh, visits by nurses and other uh, healthcare professionals, medical professionals. Okay. And then, sorry, the, the, the questions keep popping up. So <laughs> I keep thinking, okay, that's it. And then another question comes up. Um, uh, this is sort of a, a, a mixed question. Uh, can you put income into a pooled trust for nursing home Medicaid or for the NHTD program? Uh, if you're in a nursing home, uh, you cannot use a pooled trust because you have to give all of your income except $50 to the nursing home, uh, subject to your having a spouse living in the community who has low income. Then some of your, some of, or maybe all of your income would be attributed to the community spouse. Uh, so, no, the pool trust does not work in the nursing home context. Uh, in the community context, yes, uh, you can use your pool trust. You can use it for home care. You can use it uh, in an HTD. You can use it in assisted living. All right, if nothing else, I'll move on, right? Yep, that's it. Okay, that's it for now. Okay. So as I started to say, this is a common question, uh, is my home exempt? Or maybe I should put it the way I usually hear it. Isn't my home exempt? Uh, answer, uh, yes, but only so long as it is your primary residence uh, and your home equity does not exceed $1,071,000. But you see, <clears throat> this business about being your primary residence is really important because we know with absolute certainty that your home one day will no longer be your primary residence. Why? Because we know one day uh, you'll maybe move into an assisted living, you may move into a nursing home, you may move in with your children, you may pass on. So any of these things happen, your home is no longer your primary residence. And when that happens, I'm not gonna say if that happens because there's no if here, it's when that happens, uh, your home becomes a Medicaid resource and Medicaid is gonna put a lien on your home and seek to recover uh, all the expenses that it has incurred uh, taking care of you. So it's a really, really bad idea to rely on the idea that your home is exempt. Uh, for all of our clients who are applying for Medicaid or thinking about applying for Medicaid or preparing for the eventuality that they might apply for Medicaid, let's get the home out of your name, all right? Uh, you really want to protect it because you know if you leave it in your name, uh, one day it's, there's going to be a problem when it's no longer your primary residence. So <clears throat> how do we become eligible for Medicaid? Uh, well, one thought that pretty much occurs to everybody is why not just transfer my money, my property to my children? Uh, I was planning to leave it to them anyway, so we'll just give it to them a little bit earlier. Well, there are risks here in doing that. And it's not to say you can't do it. It does work for Medicaid. It is a transfer. It does get 
the money and property out of your name, but if you do it, you want to be aware of the risks. Um, obviously, there's a risk of misuse of your money because once you transfer your money to a child or a niece or nephew or a sibling, it's their money. So they can spend it any way they want to. Uh, if you do this, you're doing it with the idea that they're going to hold on to your money and use it for your benefit, but they don't have to. But look, let's put that issue aside. I think a lot of people would say, well, you know, I trust my son or my daughter or both of them implicitly. I don't have any concern about that. I know they're going to do the right thing. Okay, let's accept that idea. And probably with good reason in most cases. Uh, but we have other risks here that uh, are really impossible to calculate or quantify. Uh, what if your child or your niece or nephew or whoever it is that you've transferred your money to uh, should have an accident or an illness and predecease you? Now your money is in their estate. Uh, what if they're married and they get divorced? Your money could be tied up in the divorce. What if they have a business problem and they need to declare bankruptcy or they get sued by a creditor or you run up a lot of debt that now puts uh, your money, quote unquote, your money uh, at risk. <clears throat> um, and further, um, by transferring assets that have appreciated in value or are continuing to appreciate in value, uh, you are foregoing or they are foregoing a significant uh, tax benefit. And that is when you inherit money or property, you receive that uh, that property, whether it's real property or securities, whatever it is, at its current value, at the date of death value. So let's say mom and dad bought a house 40 years ago for, I don't know, $25,000, and today it's worth $750,000, and we have all of that capital gain there. Uh, if you inherit that property, you inherit it with a value of $750,000. And if you sell it, you do not own any capital gains tax. But if mom or dad transfer that home to you during their lifetime, uh, you get the same tax basis that they do. So now you own a home that's got a $750,000 market value with a $25,000 tax basis. So if you wind up selling that home, you're going to pay a lot of capital gains tax. So, <clears throat> you know, that's another issue that is not relevant in every case, but it is in many cases where we want to look at the tax consequences of making transfers during lifetime as opposed to uh, transfers upon death. <clears throat> um, just a quick word about exempt transfers, because there are certain transfers that you can make of money and property that uh, is not an issue with Medicaid. And this is particularly important for your nursing home application. Uh, if you have a blind or disabled child, uh, you can transfer money and property to them or to a trust for their benefit. Uh, that's exempt. Trust for the sole benefit of some other disabled person who's under the age of 65. Um, I've already talked about the spousal transfers, which are also exempt. <coughs> um, transfer of your home to a caregiver child who's been living with you or transfer to a sibling uh, who has an equity interest in the home. So before we do anything in a 
case where we're looking for Medicaid, we are going to look at these uh, for the possibility of an exempt transfer. You know, obviously, in many cases, most cases, uh, we don't have the ability to do this, but when we do, it can be a, a very, very good thing. Okay, so Cindy, you have another question? Yes. Um, a person uh, asked a question, I have a case where the husband is well and his wife needs community Medicaid to get home care and because of the high cost of medications, what should they do about their joint assets and accounts? So can you explain a little bit about how, about how uh, spousal transfers and spousal refusal work? Yeah, well, in that circumstance, unless we're anticipating, um, you know, nursing home and the short term, um, I'd probably think about a solution other than a spousal transfer. I might want to think about putting money in a trust, which would protect both spouses, uh, not just the one spouse who uh, needs care or might need care soon. So every case is different. You know, every uh, case calls for its own solution. There's no kind of one size fits all here. But, you know, we have a lot more options in the community side than we do in the nursing home side because of the five-year look back. So when we're looking to establish liability, uh, sorry, uh, eligibility for uh, Medicaid, community Medicaid, we have a lot of options, you know, and we can consider spousal transfers, we can consider spouses to ch uh, transfers to children or other family members, and we consider can consider trusts. And I think oftentimes uh, the trust may be the best answer because uh, it would protect both spouses uh, and solve a lot, of, a lot of other things at the same time. Okay, thank you. All right, so this does get me to uh, the irrevocable trust. Uh, sometimes you'll hear it referred to as a Medicaid trust. Uh, we're talking about the same thing here. Uh, this is uh, a trust, a vehicle that uh, is extensively used in elder law practice to protect people's savings and money and property, uh, and at the same time, uh, put them in a position to uh, apply for and be eligible for uh, these generous Medicaid benefits. Uh, it will also contain their estate plan. Uh, so there's no probate, there's no court proceeding uh, when you pass on. Uh, <clears throat> the assets are simply distributed directly from the trust without anybody having to go to court. Uh, and uh, beneficiaries get that nice a tax benefit that avoids capital gains tax. Um, I think that uh, this solution, the irrevocable trust, is probably the best one uh, that we have. Um, it's sometimes not appealing to some clients because uh, you do have to give up control. Uh, if you have this type of trust, you cannot be the trustee. You cannot be in charge of the trust. Uh, you cannot have uh, any direct access to the <clears throat> assets in the trust. Because if you did have access, if the trust assets were available to you, then Medicaid would count those assets as your resources. Uh, so it wouldn't work if you didn't uh, sort of respect the idea that this is an irrevocable trust and you do not control it. Um, that being said, uh, the trust 
uh, can say that if you've transferred ownership of your home, whether it's a condo, a co-op, or uh, another piece of real estate, or a piece of real estate, um, to the trust, the trust can give you the right to live in it for the rest of your life. Uh, the trust can give you all of the income uh, earned by the trust. So if you've transferred investments like uh, securities, that's mutual funds, stocks, bonds, and so on, and uh, the trust has earned interest and dividends or other income, uh, that can all go to you. Uh, it's not going to affect your Medicaid eligibility. It's not going to affect creditors' rights and give them access to uh, the assets in the trust. Uh, very, very good solution in many cases. Um, so let's talk for a little bit about the pooled income trust. And we don't want to confuse the pooled income trust with the trust I was just talking about. All right, the irrevocable trust, the Medicaid trust, that is to hold your assets, your home, your investments, <clears throat> whatever you want to put in it. It is an asset trust to hold and protect your assets provide an estate plan, keep it out of court, protect those assets from creditors. That's what your irrevocable trust is about. The pooled income trust is something else. Uh, it is designed to protect your monthly income if you are on Medicaid. So in the Medicaid world, if your monthly income counting your social security, your pension, your retirement benefits, anything else that you receive. Uh, if your monthly income is more than $1,732 a month, you have what Medicaid calls surplus income. Now, it may be surplus to Medicaid, it's not surplus to you, you need that money to pay your rent or your co-op maintenance or, you know, whatever monthly expenses you have. So, you know, you're not interested in giving up your so-called surplus income. And the good news is uh, you do not have to do that. You can join, again, what's called a pooled income trust. So this is essentially another bank account where you deposit your surplus income. And that money is available to you <clears throat> to spend uh, for your needs and really anything that you want. And the one main restriction here on the pool income trust is the money can only be spent on you. So you cannot pay your grandchildren's uh, school tuition, you can't uh, give money to your children or even to charity. Uh, it, the money in a pooled income trust can only be spent on you. <clears throat> and the other thing about it is you cannot, or you should not rather, you should not regard it as a savings account because should you <clears throat> no longer be living in the community, so now you're in a nursing home uh, or you die, uh, the money, the balance that, uh, if you have a balance in your pooled income trust account, it stays with the pool trust. You cannot leave it to anybody, you can't take it with you. So uh, bearing those two things in mind, the pooled income trust works very, very well. Uh, to protect your so-called surplus income when you are on Medicaid. <clears throat> so uh, let's just sorry, take a look. One, just one okay. brief question. Uh, sorry, a few, a few um, logistical questions. Um, does income in excess, of, oh yeah, so income in excess of Medicaid limits has to be transferred 
she said manually. Uh, uh, does a PIT have a routing number like any other account? In other words, could you could you transfer it via uh, uh, via bank account, or do you need to send them a check? Oh, I think I mean you'd have to talk to the individual trust about this, but I think most of them would accept a, an ACH or wire transfer. I don't, I, okay. I don't think that would be a problem. And can you talk a little bit about the cost of a of a of a pet of a pooled income trust and like who do we have somebody that we recommend? That's the that was the question. Well, um, you know, there's uh, several of these pooled income trusts that are um, authorized or licensed to operate in New York State. Uh, they all do charge uh, a fee. Some of them charge an annual fee. I think some of them charge a monthly fee. Um, you know, I, I really don't. I mean, they differ, so I'm not going to really quote a number, but it's a modest fee. And look, the bottom line here is that if you don't participate in a pooled income trust and put your surplus income in the pooled income trust, your only other choice is to give all of your surplus income to Medicaid. So I guess what I would say to you is, um, if you have to pay the pooled income trust a small fee, be happy about it because you know you're, they're giving you an option to basically hold on to most of your income and spend it on anything you want uh, rather than giving it to Medicaid. Um, and as far as particular trusts, I mean, I, I don't know that I want to get into that right now, but, uh, you know, for, with our clients, we we uh, probably have a couple that we would recommend to them. But look, everybody's different. Everybody has, you know, kind of different criteria about what's important to them. So, you know, these are kind of individual decisions. Yeah. And the last question is, can you transfer the trust balance to your, your irrevocable trust? No. Uh, you're going to need to spend it on something. Um, obviously, you can spend it on things like rent and utilities and food and clothing. Uh, but it doesn't have to be necessities. So I guess if you decide that you want a, an 80 inch flat screen TV with surround sound, uh, go ahead and do it. No problem. You know, you need a new refrigerator, a new washer dryer. Uh, you want to do some renovation in the house to make it more friendly for you um, to live there. Go ahead. You know, it's for you. It's your, it's your money. You can spend it uh, really in any way you want, as long as it's for your benefit. Um, anything else at this point, Cindy? <clears throat> nope, that's it for now. Okay, so uh, we just- Oh, have sorry, I'm sorry, sorry, one more. Sorry, one more just popped up. Are, uh, with an irrevocable trust, are there fees the same way there are with the- a pooled income trust. I'm sorry, are there what? Are there fees similar to a pooled income trust with an irrevocable trust? I'm just either not hearing this correctly or not understanding. Are there so in other words, a pooled income trust charges you a fee because they're doing oh, they're, they're helping you oh, with transactions. Sorry. A fee, a fee. Yes. Okay, so I misheard that. Are there fees? Yes. Well, and not in the same way, you know, with your pool trust, you're going to pay a monthly fee or an annual fee to the um, organization uh, that is operating the pool trust. With your irrevocable asset protection trust, your Medicaid trust, uh, you're typically going to pay a fee to a law firm for creating it for you. And after that, uh, you are going to have to file tax returns, uh, which are really very simple returns because 
typically the irrevocable trust does not pay any income tax. And so it's a pretty simple tax return. Uh, and you may need to pay your trustee or trustees uh, some compensation. Uh, so, it, you know, that depends. If it's a family member, they're typically not taking compensation. Um, if you've employed a professional trustee, they're obviously going to want to be paid. Um, <clears throat> even family members, they're legally entitled to compensation. Uh, many of them don't take it, but uh, so that would be the the things that would I guess I would say are in the fee category. Okay. Uh, yeah. The, uh, so the the sorry, I you know how um, the uh, questions about pooled in income trusts just keep coming. Uh, what you know what? Uh, uh, can you just review one more time? That do you send? Do you just send the pooled income trust enough money to cover the month's expenses? Just explain that again. And no, and the pooled income that. trust can be done. You can join a pooled income trust right away when applying for community Medicaid, since there is no look back. Can you confirm that? Yes, the time to to join a pooled income trust is when you are applying for community Medicaid. Okay. That's when you uh, do it. There's no reason right. to have one bef before that. Uh, and there's no reason to have one if you're in a nursing home because you can't use it if you're in a nursing home. Right. So it is specifically for people who are on community Medicaid. Right. And the um, so uh, the person said for the pooled income trust, you do you send them just enough money to cover the month's expenses? No, you have to send them your surplus income, whatever right. that number is. So right now the income limit is one thousand seven hundred and thirty two dollars. So that's the amount that you can keep in your own bank account and you can spend that money any way you please. So if you want to buy a gift for your grandchildren or pay part of their school tuition or do whatever you want, you can do it with that money. So all the rest of your income must go into the pooled income trust account, and that money can only be spent on you. So just to put this in concrete terms, let's just say with your social security, your pension, your distributions from your 401k or your IRA, you have $3,732 a month in income. <clears throat> so if that's your case, and this is just a hypothetical example, you have $2,000 of surplus income. So that amount would need to be deposited each month in your pooled income trust. Okay, good. All right, On onward and upward. Okay, onward. So you've submitted a community Medicaid application, uh, you've waited two or three months or maybe four months, it's been approved. Uh, you have a Medicaid number, you're on Medicaid. However, you don't have any care yet, nothing's happened. Well, <clears throat> you're gonna need to uh, get evaluated and enrolled in a managed long-term care plan, an MLTC. Uh, you're going to need to hire uh, caregivers through a home care agency or through the CDPAP program that we already discussed. Uh, if you're thinking about assisted living, you need to find uh, one that you're happy with and, and one that accepts Medicaid. Uh, 
And if you've done uh, all of that on the home care side and uh, you really need a nursing home level of care, at that point, you can start uh, looking to the NHTD program. So there's still a number of steps to go through uh, after you get your Medicaid approval. Uh, again, there are different evaluations that are needed in order to get you into the home care program. Um, and, <clears throat> you know, when these evaluations occur, it's good to have um, uh, an advocate there. Uh, it might be family member or um, our law firm also provides that type of assistance um, with our director of client care and advocacy. Uh, but you, you know, I think all too often uh, seniors who have applied for Medicaid and they're being evaluated for their needs, you know, they're, they're prideful, you know, that reluctant to admit that they need help when they do. Uh, that's a common issue. So, you know, it's not the time to say, well, no, I can do that when you really can't. Uh, you want to be uh, accurate about what your needs are. And that oftentimes it's good to have a family member or somebody there who can make it clear what your needs really are. So I think that's our program for today. And